Hello and thank you for joining us as we talk about Ireland. I'm Jim Bruce and recently I met Kevin Myers at his home at Kildare. Kevin Myers was born and raised in England, the son of Irish immigrants who settled in Leicester. In his late teens, he moved to Ireland where he studied history at UCD. Following graduation, he entered journalism, firstly as a reporter for the short-lived News Site magazine, and then as a junior correspondent for RTE News. During the 1970s, he reported on the Northern Ireland Troubles, an eventful period covered in his acclaimed memoir, Watching the Door. In 1980, he followed in the footsteps of Patrick Campbell and Seamus Kelly when he joined the Irish Times as principal writer of An Irishman's Diary, a position he occupied for the next 26 years. Between 1991 and 2001, he hosted RTE Television's Challenging Times, a quiz show for third-level students. Among his published books are two collections of his Irish Times columns, two volumes of his memoirs, a novel, Banks of Green Willow, and Ireland's Great War, a collection of his extensive writings on Irish involvement in the First World War. A third volume of his memoirs is due to be published later in 2020. Our conversation took place on a mild and sunny day in January, and you may be able to hear the sounds of vibrant nature in the background. I'd like to start our discussion by asking you about the changes you have seen in Ireland over the course of your life. Do any big things come to mind? Well, I wouldn't call what's happened to Ireland changes. It's been a transformation. I don't think anyone arriving in Ireland today would recognise the Ireland I arrived in in, in 1966 when I became a student in UC, University College Dublin. This was a, a, an Ireland where the purchase of condoms was, was criminal. That it wasn't just that people didn't have the right to get married if you were homosexual. That, that it was a criminalised act between men, not between women. That there was a massive censorship in Ireland in the 1950s, 1954. There were 5,000 titles banned in Ireland. When I arrived, the title was down to 2,000. These are books that are easily available in Belfast, and Ireland had created two separate. Uh, and very distinct political and, and social cultures in the two parts of the island. And they weren't recognisable. And the Ireland that we have now, north and south, is very similar. The, the most of the kind of features that people take for granted are shared in the way that wouldn't have been the case in the 1960s. And the two parts of Ireland have actually converged in many ways, culturally, mm. even politically, socially. They resemble one another in the way that they wouldn't have done uh, 40 years ago. Partitionism had been incredibly successful, and now it is receding in, in most regards. And in, in addition to which, Ireland, which in the 1960s was one of the most closed countries in the world, is now economically and culturally one of the most open. So that we have large numbers of people coming, immigrating from all over the world, quite the opposite of what was happening in the 1960s when people were fleeing Ireland to find sanctuary elsewhere. So you're, you're generally painting a pretty positive picture of Ireland today relative to its position about 50 years ago? If I'm painting a positive um, image, it's because it's, I've so far had a limited opportunity to, to describe my feelings about what's happening because I am concerned that what's happening to Ireland is, uh, represents an irrever irreversible transformation which another generation will greatly re regret, as I believe many people in Britain have regretted the opening up of their borders so that the identity of, of British people is no longer recognisable as that what it was. But was the identity of the Irish people back in the 60s an entirely positive one as far as you're concerned? I'm talking about the Republic relative to... The North. Well, the problem is that it, it, you can't get nostalgic about the past because the identity has expressed itself politically, uh, socially, legally in Ireland in the 1960s was extremely limited. It was presumed that if you were Irish, uh, you were Catholic, and it was presumed that Catholic norms could be enforced by the rule of state, the state. So I'm not painting a, a, a honey picture or a glow of, of Ireland then, but it, it would have been possible with a carefully considered dialogue and conversation to have created a liberal Ireland that would not have been uh, 
uh, amenable to transformations by um, other forces over which we have no control. And I, I feel very, very strongly that uh, the no notion of a state is that state has many ingredients which define itself as a state, and one of those is the ability to protect its borders. And a state must run itself pretty much like a private home. And you don't open your doors in your private home to just anybody. Nor should we as a state open our doors to just anybody. But we have an immigration policy which is based entirely on the wishes of immigrants and not on the wishes of the people already here. And that's mad. Well, perhaps we'll, we'll get into that in greater detail. Um, but having sketched out the period we're talking about, the last 50, 60 years, when you do look back over that period, is there anything that strikes you as having been a particularly positive development in Irish life, Irish society, Irish culture? The most obvious transformation and one which I greatly enjoyed was the sexual liberation, which has allowed people to have sex without guilt or taboo and to, to the point where it's a norm that people... Uh, live together before they marry one another and that ha has to be an improvement on what existed but all of these transformations conjoined have their downsides and contrary to what I, ex I expected contrary to what most of my generation expected when we lost one set of values associated largely with the Catholic Church we assumed that what would result would be secular freedoms now, we know this is not the case, that a new religion has arrived and it's very dogmatic, it's just as dogmatic as the Catholic Church of the 1950s. And this is a secular, compulsory secular um, religion, which is obviously it's godless, but it's very dogmatic and intolerant of dissent. So you can't actually, in, in our modern um, despotism, disagree with homosexual marriage without being called homophobic. You can't um, raise questions about the prudence of immigration without being called xenophobic. You can't challenge the, um, the triumph of uh, feminism uh, without being called um, misogynist. So in the recent decades, certainly in the last decade, any dissent is anathematized as belonging to an utterly unacceptable uh, group of people. The terms I've just used, misogynist, uh, xenophobic, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so we have a new set of values which are as uh, impositionally um, intolerant as those of the Catholic Church. And I think that's probably the way human beings work. In the absence of a clear set of ideologies, we're going to create a fresh set of ideologies to which people have to comply. Just going back to the sexual liberation, which you, you see as, as, a, as the great positive change over the course of the period we're talking about. Are you surprised that it became so prevalent in Ireland at all, given our background? Or were there other factors which made it, um, let's say, acceptable in this country? But the Irish prudishness, and it was far more than prudishness, but we'll settle for that term, is largely a consequence of the famine. Pre-famine, uh, Ireland was sexually very relaxed, very tolerant. It wasn't as dogmatically Catholic in, 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 in both their sexual practices and in, in their marital rights. Lots of people before uh, the famine would get married, but uh, would have sex before they were getting married. They, as long as they had an association, it was acceptable to have sex. The, tr the, 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 the famine transformed that. And the famine is the great dividing uh, and defining um, effect or event in, in Irish history. And the Irish people were traumatised beyond belief and description by, by the famine. Not merely did it inculcate enormous, and understandably, enormous amounts of Anglophobia. It created crippling institutions and crippling uh, neuroses about um, sexuality. And I think the Irish people have emerged finally from the, the, the aftermath of the famine in, in, in this 20th century, but we've in 21st century. But in, in the meantime, we've imported all sorts of doctrinaire liberalism, which I, I don't believe in the long run will be healthy for the Irish people or anywhere where doctrinaire liberalism triumphs. So the sexual liberation was not a planned evolution in Irish cultural mores. It was something that was a byproduct or a consequence of other factors which were 
largely imported. Is that how you would see it? Well, in, in part, it, it, the importation of ideas from abroad uh, was important and unstoppable once we had television and radio, once you had access to the media from other countries, once you had British newspapers and American magazines and so on flooding the marketplace, sooner or later it, was, it would be impossible to continue to have the repressive uh, legislation that we had. But simultaneously, Ireland opened itself up economically. We became, instead of what we had been, an isolationist island, on a wet corner of the Atlantic, which was immune to influence from outside or attempted to be immune, from, immune to influence from outside, it became the most open economy in the world. And you can't have that without other cultural transformations occurring. So sexual liberation was a benefit, a plus. What were the cultural or societal advantages, if you like that, came from this opening up of sexual liberation? Well, personally, I, I, I enjoyed greatly when I was a younger man and not so young the, the fact that I could actually have sex with women without any complications. And within the, the sector of Irish society to which I'm I sorry, belong... When you say complications, what, what exactly are you referring to there? There are no social complications if you're having sex with somebody who wasn't your marriage. There was you mean no, if, if um, people get to know about this relationship? No, the, no, no one ever judged anyone. Yeah, and that, yeah. that was the case throughout my life. And th- that, there has never amongst my peer group been any judgment of anybody because they're having sex. It was the norm from the 1960s that we assumed mm. if you uh, uh, work with somebody, you were having sex. That's, and sex didn't, wasn't the culmination of a long period of courtship, it would happen quite rapidly. But at the same time, the Catholic Church wouldn't have uh, looked fondly on no, they would that not. kind of relationship. So would no. that not have been a, a disadvantage? Socially? No, but the, this, the peer group I'm talking about is the metropolitan liberal elite in, in, in Dublin. They, that wouldn't have represented in any sense the values that would have, you would have found in Mullingar or Connemara mm-hmm. or Donegal. But for, for us, approximately of the Dublin Four, geographic location uh, and of middle class background university educated everybody just about was having sex everybody looked on homosexuality as a perfectly legitimate and normal Mm. orientation Mm. where either you had or you hadn't got it but it wasn't an issue but that wouldn't have been the case in ireland generally Uh, attempts to uh, legalize the sale of condoms were prevented uh, in throughout the 1980s Condoms only became legally available, widespread legally available in the 1990s, at the same time as the the prohibition on male homosexual acts was lifted. So you're talking about really, I suppose, a subculture in the country which implemented the elements of the Cultural Revolution, which was coming from other countries before anybody else did. Well, uh, yes, we practised what was going on uh, elsewhere in Europe. And to tell you the truth, we didn't realise that we were just a tiny bubble and that our practices and our habits and our expectations and our appetites uh, were not matched by those outside that tiny geographical area. But because we talked to one another, we believed our opinions were universal, as we all believed were socialists in those days, and we believed everyone wanted to be socialists when, in fact, all the electoral evidence is there's no appetite for socialism in Ireland at all. I'm thinking of a term which is used in, in um, technology, early adopters. So the early adopter is the um, pioneer before it reaches the mass market. So in a sense... The sexual liberation that emerged from the 1960s didn't reach the mass market until much later than the 1960s. But you were part of a subculture who um, began the process. Yeah, change. but it took it took just about 25 or 30 years for mm-hmm. these attitudes to, to become uh, widespread and to become prevalent. And not because of our influence, but so much as because of the international influence. Um, in the, through the media and through the, a kind of common perception that these were norms elsewhere and there's no reason for Ireland once it economically entered the rest of the world and culturally, why ethically it should be so different. So if we were to focus now on something you gar- regard as having been particularly negative in relation to the last um, 50 or 60 years of, of changes, is there anything that would strike you as being the most negative development of all of the ones that you've mentioned or refer to? Yeah, the, the, the rejection that somehow or other there's the notion of Irishness is, is, is special. Now, 
There was a historic approach to Irishness. It was incredibly special that the Irish were a chosen people and that Irish, the Irish people defended Catholicism with greater devotion than even the Italians or the Spanish. And that was bizarre and, and counterproductive culturally and ultimately religiously. But the, I actually think it's right for Ireland to want to protect the Irishness of the, the state and of the, Irish, uh, and of the island generally. Uh, I don't believe that's necessarily... I don't believe it's in the least xenophobic, but I think it's an entirely appropriate thing for any society, any state, to say, well, these are our values and we, we really do benefit from immigration. This is true for Bulgaria or France or, or Norway or Sweden or Denmark or, or Russia or America or Canada. All societies have a right to protect, to exalt it, their identities. Say, these are, this identity is important to us. It's not the most important thing, but it is an important thing. And we should be able to say that, that I want to have, for example, as I was saying last year in meetings I was talking, talks I was giving in Roscommon, that I want an Irish island. And that doesn't mean I want an Ireland that's exclusively Irish, quite the reverse. I, you know, that we've benefited so much from immigration that um, we can only continue to benefit from immigration as long as it's controlled. Now, I was born in, in Leicester a very long time ago, in my adult life, Leicester has been transformed from what it was, a traditional English city with a certain number of immigrants, Irish like myself, um, Poles, um, to being a minority European city. The majority of people in Leicester are of uh, African or Asian origin. Now, no one in Leicester was ever consulted about this. It was just presumed that this, this could happen without consultation. The same is true now of, of, of um, Bradford, it's true of, of, mm. of London. London is now only 46% white British. That's how people identify. The majority of people in Britain identify themselves as um, ethnically alien and culturally, and quite often culturally alien. And I simply don't want Ireland to go down that way. And I think this is the, the legacy of the Third Reich. Any talk, any talk about ethnos, ethnicity, is regarded as... Uh, reactionary, bigoted, or, uh, uh, and a callback to an uh, invocation of the values of the Third Reich. Now, you've raised a very interesting point, and I wonder, is there such a thing as Irish national cultural identity? Would we know it if we saw it? Is it something that we should aspire to? Who is going to define it? There is no such thing as a single Irish identity. And it's one of the most terrible characteristics of Irish life from, say, 1921 to the 1960s or 70s that there was presumed to be a higher form of Irish life, which was in the gale tucked areas of the West, which mm. spoke West, the Irish and had pretty undeveloped Catholic opinions. And that would have excluded almost the entire working class of Dublin. There are many different islands. If you go to the north, you've got the Orange Protestant Ireland and many, many factions within that with the Presbyterians and the Church of Ireland. And true, it's true of the, there are many forms of Irishness in, 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 in the Republic, in the south of Ireland. And this is true of all societies everywhere in, in, in many kinds of Frenchness and many kinds of Italianness and many kinds of Englishness. Uh, so the, the idea of having an Irish island is quite actually inclusive because it means that many people from outside can come to Ireland and invent their own sub-norms of, of, of Ireland, um, their own little redefinitions of Ireland, which is a good thing. I mean, where would we be without uh, Indian restaurants and Italian restaurants and French restaurants? We'd be nowhere. So we, we, you know, we depend on immigration in all sorts of cultural uh, ways. So we, I, I'm talking about uh, a, a benign um, I immigration that benefits both the immigrants and ourselves. And any idea of being exclusively um, Irish it has been profoundly negative. So I'm not talking about that, but I do think it's right for any society, and on this occasion we're talking about Irish, <coughs> Irish society, say, so here are our values. We, we cherish them. We believe now in the, the, the right of women to be treated with dignity and respect. We don't clothe them in ways that conceal their faces. That they, they are entitled to the, the same things in law that men are entitled to, and so on and so forth. The, generally speaking, the egalitarian agenda, and I don't like the term egalitarianism because I don't, like, I don't believe in the thing of equality. Equality is, is a meaningless 
um, unicorn. You can't find it anywhere. But there are the general aspirations encompassed by that term egalitarianism, which I would um, em- embrace passionately. And one of those is um, a, t- a tolerance, particularly of tolerance. But should we be incorporating into Irish life the notion that it's right for anyone to come here, even if they practice things that we deplore, such as making girls clothe themselves entirely in hijabs Mm. and other Islamic garb? And I think that's seriously wrong. And I don't believe we should uh, create a political culture that says, well, yeah, any form of um, immigration is acceptable to the Irish people. That's not the case. So Irish culture, if you want to use that term, is... is, uh a malleable thing. It's it's evolving. It can accommodate new strains coming into it. But I'm still not sure what Irish culture actually is. How would you know Irish culture as a distinctive element from French culture or Japanese culture? There are certain traits like tolerance which are not particularly Irish, which we could certainly incorporate. But are there anything, any any specific elements which define Irish culture, which make it different to other cultures? You're right to say that our tolerance has not been a quality of, of Irish life. That's been distinctly so. It's not a, a quality of Irish life now. People like myself who try to raise these questions are shunned and have been put shut down. And I'm not just not just myself, John Waters and Eamon Dunphy, uh, Mary Ellen Sinan. All of us have been silenced mm. by, the, by the liberal mob. The question you ask is actually very important about how do you define Irishness? And what are the qualities of Irishness that uh, make it special? Well, it's not all that special being Irish, but it is special to the Irish. And that's what is important. That's true for any identity. You, you, you create norms for that identity to express itself. In, and you agree on those norms. So the people in Ballymun, in working class area of Dublin or Ballyfermot, will have a definition of Irishness that will be pretty much the same as a definition of Irishness in Connemara, in, in undeveloped rural areas of the very West. And this is based on a, a greed history, on a, a perception of self, which is, it brings different people together with different accents, different religions, different classes. But it, is, it goes back to this thing that I referred to early on, ethnos, the Greek concept of ethnicity, which binds people together, no matter how different they actually are. And I I see no reason why one should deplore ethnos. Ethnos doesn't mean that you don't have outsiders. Ethnos means that outsiders come here with respect for the values that they find existing in this place, and they fit in, and they can fit in hugely and richly, bringing with what they, they have without, as I said before, I said a hundred times, where would our food be without mm. uh, all these restaurants? And, and, and Cabbage and potatoes and a bit of bacon on the side. That's, that's right. Mm. Now, I, I can look at the other direction, but in the, the place where I was born, Leicester. When the immigrants uh, arrived in Leicester, the uh, consequences were 100% virtuous. 100% virtuous. The shops, are, it seems incredible now, all shops in Leicester were closed on Sundays. All mm. food shops were closed at five o'clock in the evening. The Pakistanis arrived and they, op- they simply ignored the laws and they, uh, they, they were opening shops almost 24 hours a day. And it was a liberation for the English people. But, you know, the nature of immigration was because it was uncontrolled, it transformed Leicester. Leicester could have benefited enormously from West Indian and um, Asian uh, immigration, as long as it wasn't uncontrolled. And it's uncontrolled immigration is the, uh, the, 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 the socially transformative force which has brought great troubles for all of Europe, not just an Irish thing or an English thing, but all of Europe. And there isn't a European capital or the indigenous residents of a European capital wouldn't look back on, on the last 30 years and not recognise grave errors were made. We have the opportunity to learn from those errors, and we are studiously avoiding doing so. Now, you mentioned a very important word there, which is history. And if I could put a proposition to you, and that is that the Irish generally seems to have looked back at their history, their recent history, and rejected it, because that history is all about, you know, the Catholic Church and its nefarious activities, particularly in relation to paedophilia, not to mention the other repressive elements of Irish culture which were associated with the Catholic Church. And they've said, no, we don't want any of that. We want to look forward and look outward 
and we will take almost anything that Europe has to offer or the world has to offer because we reject our past. Now, is that a reasonable proposition, do you think? Well, it's... It's not reasonable in this sense. It's quite clear that an awful lot of people passionately embrace a very narrow version of, of their history, our history. Uh, obviously, Sinn Féin IRA family do this most particularly. Uh, from my point of view, a most regrettable uh, phenomenon um, in, of recent times was the refusal to acknowledge the role of the uh, Royal Irish Constabulary, mm. the Irish Police Force, in the troubles of 1916 to 22. 530 of them were, were murdered, killed in terrible circumstances. Uh, 20 of them were shot dead, leaving or going to mass. And it uh, proved impossible for the state merely to acknowledge the fact that they too were Irish men and they were participants in a very complex struggle. And that struggle has now been simplified into good Irish Republicans and bad Irish policemen, and for the most part, they were Irish policemen. So that you know, the government had to abandon plans to commemorate the RIC recently because of the opposition from Republicans, and you're always going to get Republican opposition to any uh, any commemoration they dislike, and it proved that the Irish political class simply didn't have the stomach to confront. Um, the, 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 a broader interpretation or accept a broader interpretation of Irish history. So it, the, it, it's, it's not as simple as just rejecting the past quite clearly from recent uh, events and more particularly uh, the commemorations in 2016. These were widely commemorated and celebrated uh, and many people looked back on the 1916 rising uh, with great pride and rejected the possibility that Actually, it was unjustified that the circumstances did not tolerate or didn't, didn't justify the taking of human life in 1916. And that opinion, which I passionately hold, was quite clearly widely rejected by our political classes and that not one TD, not one senior politician or even minor politician uh, turned up to at the memorial service for the security forces, most of them Irish, um, killed in the 1916 Rising. I mean, there were, there were two, the two services for the Dublin Metropolitan Policemen who were murdered in cold blood, who were unarmed, not one politician turned up for them. So there's quite clearly a, a almost atavistic devotion to the, 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 the gods of yesteryear. The, 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 the religious gods are gone, but the secular Republican gods remain. That's it for part one. My conversation with Kevin Myers continues in part two.